Okay, we're back. We're back, I guess. And hopefully we're not echoing we're not nearly as anymore. much. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> All right. You're such a bastard. So uh, we were chatting briefly a minute ago about uh, why the uh, hearing versus visual system in Neverwinter is the way it is. So uh, separate hearing from render, allowing invisible object to speak with chat and make other sounds. So why was hearing tied to rendering? That's what I was asking. Um, hearing was tied to rendering because the visibility system in terms of whether to draw a character or not, whether a character existed in the area or not, was all tied to the graphic mm. side. So the engine would basically say, is this guy visible? No, he's cast invisibility. So it would kind of exclude them from everything, including shadows, everything. Interesting. And that also impacted the audio. So chat, any sort of communication. So we can fix that. Yeah. Uh, what's the other one? Oh, right. So this feature, expose more requirement parameters for custom classes. This actually addresses the question of uh, why we hopped into Trello in the first place, oh, yeah. which was uh, 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 how and when are we going to make custom classes more, more easy? So this is one of those things that we need to do on the road toward that. So you're going to be able to uh, construct uh, classes that have more specific class requirements class regarding like uh, yeah. gender, custom yeah. variables. I think the big thing is that. just so stepping. Able to uh, construct uh, classes that have more specific requirements regarding like uh, yeah. gender, custom variables. I think the big thing is that. just so stepping. Gate one. A place where to send your companions removed from the group, like the Friendly Arm Inn. Well, the Copper Coronet is kind of like that. But it's PG-2. So, yeah. One. Well, they're can saying, you can you backport that the, concept? Oh, so they want basically oh. a Copper Coronet equivalent for well, BG-1. Well, I mean, like the Friendly Arm Inn already does yeah. that. Well, they're saying but uh, that, that sounds like so the perfect sort of thing that a mod could BG1. accomplish. Well, I, th I think that is a brilliant well, concept true. for a mod. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, what games like have you guys been, been playing when you are burned out from developing Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition? That is a brilliant uh, I've been uh, another question from the audience. What games like have you guys been playing when you are burned out from developing Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition? Uh, I've been <laughs> I didn't have to brainwash them. They begged to serve me. I just had to say, yeah, it's okay to give up on your Sauron master and come with my side of the universe. Yeah, you put them in an impossible... You've got a blade to up to their neck, and you're like, do you, do you want to join yeah, me? Okay no, I like, didn't. It's a false choice. I didn't stick a blade to them. I, I, I beat them down until they were submissive, and then I, uh, I did some kind of evil mind control on them. Signed under duress. That's exactly what you've done to these orcs. You say that like it's a bad thing. And then I, uh, um, so they're orcs, dude. What, what other well, games? So, I mean, obviously FTL, an incredible That's game that is now that like six years game. old and still, I think, one of the best uh, games. FTL is not six years old. What it can't be. It can't be. But no, I guess recently what I've been playing. Six years old and still, I think, one of the best FTL is not six years old. It can't be. It can't be. But no, I guess recently what I've been playing. Six years old and still, I think, one of the best FTL is not six years old. It can't be. It can't be. We just watch Dan lose his mind while we just sit here and babble like puppets. Poor guy. Poor guy. Pop, 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 pop. Uh, we've added some new cards as well to the roadmap active. So get walk mesh slash surface type via NW script. So that's really just adding a query so you can query down to the walk mesh and say, am I on rocks, gravel, or am I on P gravel? Oh. And then you can apply difficult terrain bonuses as you see fit. One could. One could do such a thing. That's right. Uh, the other one is uh, never want to script play movie function for custom content. So because everything's WebM now, it's way easier the tool path for creating your own movies and we'll add in a scripting command so people can play their own movies right. in the game when they want to. Right, the next one I think is super cool and it's actually kind of a big deal. Uh, improved shader communication so you can send data from NW script into the shader before it renders. So you can customize and reuse shaders on the fly. There's, 
we're going to be doing a ton of work around the shader system and the open nature of it and what we can send back and forth. And yeah. I think this, the next one after that is improve shaders to be able to render on objects, not just textures. So this one refers to how historically shaders were bound to a texture. It was one texture per object and the shaders were bound to the texture via a TXI. Now, going forward, the way it'll work is that it'll still be bound to the, it'll be bound to the material, essentially, not to the texture. So, again, opening it up, making it a little easier to use, making it capable of doing more, more than it historically could. Fair enough. Um, what is your most legendary moment in your own personal D&D &D tabletop game? Ooh, I have a couple stories I need to think about. I, I was, I was, uh, I was playing an assassin and uh, I assassinated half of the party <laughs> that I was supposed to join. So uh, they all conspired and trapped me in a deep pit and then proceeded to fireball and meteor swarm me to death. But the DM felt that my role playing was so on par that uh, a, a god who had basically become the enemy of the party decided to resurrect me as, as his hand of vengeance and herald. sent me off chasing down the party that I was supposed to join. And uh, it culminated with me murdering the last of them, at which point we, uh, we decided that I was a bastard and I could never play with that group again. <laughs> Fair enough. They were um, so right. All right, I have, I have two stories I'll tell. The first one doesn't count because it's not actually d d It was Star Wars D20. Oh. Star Wars D20. I know, I know Star Wars D6 was the better system, but, you know, Star Wars D20 had its own charm. So this was a campaign that I was playing on with some friends uh, shortly before I moved to Alberta, actually. So this was right at the tail end, and I was like, guys, I can only do a couple more sessions, and then I'm taking off, moving away. So I was playing a droid, a uh, big, heavy cargo lifter droid who was dumb as a, as a brick, but he was incredibly strong and big, bulky guy. So we're, uh, we get involved with some rebels, and we're smuggling some junk. It's Star Wars, you know, why not? And uh, so we get into this fight where we're racing through this canyon in our ripoff of the Millennium Falcon as these TIE fighters are following us and shooting at us. And this is the last session that I have, so it's like, I got to go out, and I got to go out in a big way. You got to go out big. Got to go out big. So it's like, all right. I, t I asked the, the, the DM, how long would it take for me to upload my consciousness to the ship's computer? And he's like, man, that's like a six-hour thing. Don't do that. And I'm like, oh, fine, all right. So I, I tie a, uh, a cable around my robot waist, and I get uh, a handful of thermal detonators from the cargo hold. And I climb onto the top of the ship. As it's weaving through this canyon, I'm hanging onto the top. And I'm hurling grenades off of the back of the ship at these pursuing TIE fighters. Uh, believe it or not, the dexterity checks on that kind of thing are insanely high. And when you're a big, clumsy robot, you're not hitting anything. What are the odds? What are the odds? So I decided, you know what? I have to go out in a blaze of glory. So I flicked off a thermal detonator, untied uh, myself, and just leapt off the back of the ship into the TIE fighters. And I was like, I told the DM, I'm like, all right. I want to try breaking through the front glass of the TIE fighter, pulling the pilot out, and then piloting the ship and taking over. Uh, so I slam into the front of the TIE fighter, bounce off, and hit the side of the canyon and detonate. Uh, I did take the TIE fighter with me, yeah. but I did not <laughs> manage to fly away. <laughs> like you, you house. did detonate on the canyon wall, which is awesome. Uh, all right. So, so saying that reminded me of a story. Okay, you go. You, so, you do the next one. So this was during. This this has nothing to do with D and D and role playing. This is James Olen, and we're talking about Star Wars. This is before Knights of the Old Republic comes out, and and James is like pounding on the table, and he's like, "When you want to play Star Wars, what do you want?" And I was like, "Dude, I want a Wookie." And I want to tell my Wookiee to rip somebody's arms off. And, and everybody just keeps going. And James is basically, he tells us the high gospel of what Star Wars is. Star Wars is, I want a spaceship that's as awesome as the Falcon. I want to smuggle things. I want a lightsaber. I want to force choke somebody. I want to shoot some force lightning. Uh, I got to have a Wookiee. I got to tell the Wookiee to rip somebody's arms off. There can be some droids. They can do some meep, meep, moop, moop. And, but it's got to be, these are the big iconic moments you've got to have. You've got to have a I villain. He's got to be things. scary as hell. Yeah. Yep. That sounds like a pretty accurate reading of Star Wars. Yep. 
but I still remember the Wookiee ripping people's arms off. That is like a that is canonical requirement of any Star Wars game. Did Have a uh, Wookiee rip people's arms off. What was the name of the Wookiee from Kotor One? It starts with a Z. Zen something? Oh my god. Zarbar? Zorgato? Oh. It's my fault. Sorry guys. <laughs> Phil is the source of all echoes. It was me all along. All right, one last D and D story. Before Phil is we a jackass. Um, well, actually, we got to finish going through the rule through the improvements here. All right. Um, there's another question to allow tab mouse over highlight or a color customization through NW script, and uh, I saw that one getting looked at today. Actually, that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, that one should be pretty easy it's to do. Funny how the communicating with shaders through the scripting language kind of slots into that one. And then one last really big one, the UI refactor. This is one that a lot of people have been asking about. It has many, 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 many different facets to it. So we've moved that one uh, back to the ice box because we need a little bit more investigation and information on how we're going to do this. So this is still coming. We're just reshuffling priorities for this one. Yeah, we, we started doing some investigation on it and we came to the conclusion that we need to do more investigation on it. Yeah. So. There, there's a lot of work to do there, uh, but rest assured, we're still working on it. Yeah. And uh, before I tell my last D&D &D story, uh, coming in patch 8156, which is not coming out this week, but next, uh, the exciting stuff that we were talking about before, so normal map support, spec map support. We're going to be experimenting with uh, NAT tunneling, which uh, actually, sorry, NAT. NAT punching. punching. It's all about punching NATs. That's right. <laughs> Um, so there's been a lot of discussions around, hey, wouldn't it be great if I could start up a server and not have to dick around with my firewall so that other people could join? That's what NAT punching is all about. Um, with the next patch, we hope to start experimenting with that. So if you are one of those people who are trapped behind a horrifying firewall that you cannot easily control, this one's for you, baby. All right. It should be awesome. Um, all right. The story. Okay. Yep. You had a story. This one's more recent. So uh, we were playing uh, Escape from the Underdark, the recent module that Watsi put out. Okay. I joined the campaign about halfway through. So they had gotten back to the surface, and they were the party was just starting that little segment where you get like three warriors and six mercenaries and whatever, and you like encounter three or four events on the road from one location to the next. Um, so that's roughly where I joined the party. I was a Durgar sorcerer named Marduk. Uh, I just have I love ancient Babylon, you know, great names, great people, great times. So Marduk joins the party and I had uh, kind of worked out a deal with the DM where I was going to be sort of like a brief guest star. There was no plan for me to stay <laughs> for a very long time. This is going to be like a four or five session stint. A brief guest star. So uh, Marduk joins the party. They've got like a barbarian, you know, they got a, a, a wizard. They've got like a full party. They've even got one dude who has a, uh, a shield guardian who's controlled by an amulet he has. So they've basically got like an extra party member. So Marduk shows up and he's a bit of a, a merchant, let's say. He uh, okay. pretends that he buys and sells goods of exceedingly rare uh, quality and, and, and whatnot. So I kind of joined the party, and I, uh, he's you know, an overtly evil guy, but he's just, he just sounds greedy, you know? He's a Durgar. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, what I was planning on doing was uh, selling multiple party members into slavery. <laughs> so they had, uh, in addition to that shield guardian, they also had another guy who was basically this big hulking golem or whatever. And so on the way to this, uh, I guess it was a Durgar settlement that we were heading to, uh, I strike up a conversation with this guy, I kind of earn his trust, and then we end up like getting attacked by some monsters, and I'm willing to save a guy, but I'm like, hey, I can save you, but only if you give me your amulet that controls the shield guardian. So he's like, hey, that sounds like a good deal. Here you go. And I'm like, oh boy, now I can help you guys with my new shield guardian. So uh, we get to the town, and we decide to split the party up because we had found these very valuable eggs that had some creatures inside of them. And so I'm like, hey, guys. As a Durgar, I know that there is a uh, Durgar place here in town that has a menagerie of exotic <laughs> animals. And if only we brought these eggs to them, we could sell them and make quite a profit. You, hulking golem man, you will come with me and we will sell these eggs. The rest of you, go deal with the investigation that we're worrying about. So uh, we go to the menagerie. I trick him into hauling the eggs into a cage that the Durgar have set up. And then I send the shield guardian behind him to basically shove him into the cage. 
Uh, the DM, of course, didn't want to make this a complete blowout in my favor, so it turns into a bit of a struggle where this golem and the shield guardian are basically wrestling. As I'm summoning skeletons to try help to push this guy into the cage, and uh, it was a lot of fun. The, uh, the party races across the city to show up. There's this massive showdown. I end up breaking all of the cages in the menagerie, so all these crazy creatures are running around to cause a distraction. And uh, they ended up beating me, of course, because how could you, how could you not? Because you're, you, you don't let the guest star dominate the party. But it was, it was so much fun getting to be both a party member and a villain. It was just a complete blast. And the guy, when, when I revealed my treachery, no one in the party knew because I was passing notes to the DM this whole time. He was just like wide-eyed. He started sweating during the role-playing session. And I was like, this is what I came here to do. So that's my story. So while you were telling your story, somebody requested uh, a shot of the Elven Dagger. So the neat thing about it is because it's quite heavy with the brass, it balances about there. I'm not going to let it go because it'll tip back on my finger because it's balancing on a very narrow point. But because the, the hilt is actually quite heavy, it balances really nice. It's actually pretty cool. I'm reasonably happy with it, and uh, I mean, it's got some flaws, and when I look at it, I see the flaws because that's just how I'm wired. So by the time I build number 27, it will be effing awesome. Until then, there will be flaws. But this one's kind of cool, and I do love the blue Kyranite with the brass. It's, uh, it's, it's Protoss colors. And Blizzard taught me well back in the day there, there with the early early cinematics. It was all, if you want it to look good, use blue and gold together because they're beautiful every, complementary every movie colors. Poster orange and blue, yeah. yellow and blue. Yeah. See, red and green are complementary, but it screams Christmas. So they've Christmas has totally ruined the complementary red and green. Um, so God. just to follow up, one Damn of the questions Christmas. earlier, I forgot to answer. What games have you been playing when you're burned out from developing Everwinter and ICE? Uh, Trent mentioned you said FTL. I, I said, said FTL, Shadow of War. But the game that I'm really playing lately is Vermintide, um, which is just fantastic. I mean, who doesn't love Vermintide? I, I haven't played Vermintide. It's so good, man. If I could make a D&D Vermintide, I think that would be an awesome product. That would be a lot of fun. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing it. Just, that wasn't, I was just speaking out of turn here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Question from the audience. What about new content for the original campaign, Shadows of Undertide, or Hordes of the Underdark? You've actually had some thoughts about this, Trent. Um, yeah, I usually kind of say the, the same things over and over, which is we don't want to go back and revisit the original campaign and revisit the content that has already been done. I think our goal is to instead put our, our effort behind new content and new stuff that would bring all new adventures forward. Um, that said, I have been playing the official campaign and I have a list of hate that I have written up and I have actually loaded the module into the tool set and I have actually changed things on my own computer and I'm still angry and, and saying bad words at the, the official campaign. I've, I've even seen now. the list. It is absolutely riddled with cuss words. But uh, ultimately, we're going to put our effort forward onto newer stuff. And that, that really comes to where I see the, the big value coming in. Well, that being said, though, um, if we do roll out, uh, you know, like newer, newer content that worked with old content, then the, yeah. old, the old campaigns would automatically get an upgrade. But, well, the, but the, the other thing is, I mean, if you're, if you're playing the official campaign and, and you want to you wanna make a change to it, you want to make a mod to it, just copy the, the Neverwinter module file out of that directory, copy it into your, into your modules directory, rename it .mod, you can totally edit it. That's what we do. We will uh, need to clean some stuff up in there. Another question from the audience. When will we see the great battle of our time? Phil against the dragon-sized cat. So first of all, I said uh, cat-sized dragon because obviously or a dragon-sized dragon cat, cat is going to murder me. And second of all, the second you can make that thing a reality, I will absolutely fight it because it's like, who wouldn't want to be world famous as the guy who first died to a giant creature? Unnaturally giant yeah. creature. Uh, question, did you complete Pillars of Eternity and which character did you complete Pillars of Eternity with? Did I complete Pillars? I did complete Pillars of Eternity, but it was like two years ago. I, I didn't. I and didn't I finish had... Pillars of Eternity. I, I fell off the wagon. There, I had their equivalent of a paladin. That was my main character. 
Please make a D and D version, or sorry, please make a VR version of Vermintide based on D and D. Okay. <laughs> If, Give me some money, if, man. If you I were to wire that. us the sum of twenty millions of the dollars, I, I also would love to make that. <laughs> we but, could uh, we could start on such a thing. So VR is cool. It's not going anywhere this time. Uh, in previous iterations, it went away, but now I think it's around for to stay. However, it is very very difficult to recoup your investment in VR right now because the install base is so low. So. Yeah. All these publishers who initially were like, hey, yeah, let's throw a few million bucks at uh, VR, see what happens. Now they're like, let's not do that. Let's throw 30 grand at VR and see what sticks. Yeah, and Vermintide in VR would be a little bit of a challenge to do on 20 grand. So if you would like to let me play with your money, I and, and am you had, more than happy. You had 20 of the millions for Phil to play with. I am more than happy to build you a VR Vermintide D&D clone. I would love to do that. Uh, here's another question. Have you played the RPG Anachronox? Anachronox. Anachronox? I did, but this was back in the 90s, and I remember nothing about it. It was the, um, or maybe I'm thinking of Arcanum. No, Anachronox no, no. was like the sci-fi. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. With there's David this Bowie. period where there's about four or five of them that kind of blend for me. Or was that Messiah? No. Anachronox had David Bowie. Did it? Yeah. The, the Wait, Bowie no, time. I'm thinking of uh, Omicron, the Nomad Soul had David Bowie. That's what had David Bowie. In yeah, it. right. No, Anachronox was, uh, or am I thinking of Nox? Nox was the Westwood one. It was like a Diablo yeah. sort of clone. And it was actually really, really good. And I'm sad that they didn't keep it going. So to whoever asked the question, sorry, we just went off in a different direction. Yeah, we totally don't remember. I vaguely remember Anachronox if it was the yeah. game I'm thinking of. If not, Yeah, it was, it was Tom Hall of, of Doom fame who was behind Anachronox. And I'm trying to remember, because it was the second uh, second game that was being done with Die Katana. Yeah, and it was like this, it was sort of a sci-fi third person sort of thing. So I, I guess we, we may have played it, but our brains are broken. Just, and we, just we cannot recall. Give me an old stack of PC gamers. I'll catch up. <laughs> It'll be a good time. Um, here's a question. Um, import custom models from Blender or 3D construction programs like DAX Studio. Uh, Blender actually has a, a series of plugins called Never Blender, which allow you to pretty much dump content straight into Neverwinter. You throw it in your override, it will work. Uh, and uh, I think going has, forward, uh, adding better Blender tool support for getting content in there is, is definitely something we're interested in. We're going to have to do it on our end anyway, so uh, it's likely any forward, tools we construct for exporting 3D models and that kind of junk is, will also be something we're interested Oh God, here's a question. Trent, what do you think of Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition? Um, I don't. <laughs> I actually deliberately don't think about games like that. So That is a Don Draper response. I, I was behind the scenes. I was the director of technology on the engine that we were using to do Dragon Age Origins, which was also used for Dragon Age 2. And we had totally different plans for that engine. And in the halfway through the research phase on that engine, we got smashed into Dragon Age and forced to go a totally different direction. And uh, the end result is that I was working on Neverwinter Nights, or sorry, I was working on it, and I was looking at Dragon Age in this horribly broken state for so many years that I just actually can't look at Dragon Age. I just can't. When I see Dragon Age, all I think is, ah, it hurts me, it hurts me, make it go away. So uh, I make it go away. Um, that being said, they're good games. I think Inquisition was, was the team doing, like, they did a ton of work. Like, getting, porting it over to a new engine, everybody's like, oh, yeah, we're going to just move over to Frostbite. It won't be legendary pain. No, moving an engine is always legendary pain. So you got to relearn how to do everything. Uh, DA2 was, uh, was a short timeline. It pushed that team hard. There was, uh, decisions I were made at, at a certain level, and, uh, I mean... I, I guess there were reasons behind it, but I, I just didn't seem like the right thing to do to me. Even at the time, like I remember visiting, actually I was visiting you at Bioware at that time. Um, and, and we got to see DA2 as it was in development. And I remember it was like six months after DA1 had shipped. And they're saying like roughly when the release date was gonna be. And even then everyone was kind of like, because eh? it was such a tight turnaround. And it's amazing what they pull off in that time, but I think they, they could have done a lot more had they been given a, a 
proper bite at it, you know? Fair enough. Uh, t-shirt time. Yeah, let's give away a t-shirt. Let's give a t-shirt to a fellow... Chocolates? By the name chocolates? of Chocolates. 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 Little chokes. Sounds good. Ah, Facebook question. Is your Neverwinter Nights one goal? I always just call it Neverwinter Nights, not one. To be as good as Neverwinter Nights 2. To be NWN 1, but with most of NWN 2's functionality. No, that is not my goal. Uh, here, my goal is to be the best that Neverwinter Nights can be. Neverwinter Nights 2 was like, hey, let's take this Neverwinter thing and let's drag it back towards Baldur's Gate. That's not what I had originally intended Baldur's Gate, or sorry, Neverwinter Nights to be. Neverwinter Nights to me was D&D &D in a box. I sit down, I got my character sheet, I'm playing my character. Baldur's Gate is, I sit down, I have my character sheets of my party, I play char name, and the supporting cast that is written it's RPG mm, football manager. It, it's it's novelesque. There was a there was a written scripted world that I play on. To me, Neverwinter was much more about I'm playing my character and I'm jumping in on somebody else's adventure and we're going stream of consciousness on it. And it's it's just fun stuff. So you know in interviews when they're like, What would you say your greatest weakness is? And then you're like, oh, I work too hard, uh, I'm too good of a worker. That's that's the answer you gave for I want Neverwinter One to be better than Neverwinter Two. <laughs> really? Similar. It's just funny. I didn't get. Yeah. <laughs> that's not how I perceive it. I mean, I agree. Neverwinter One. I think when we're done, is going to be a more extensive platform. If we get to do everything that we want to do, I think it'll be an improvement over Neverwinter Two. Yeah, and. I mean, there's some overlap there between what the two games do, and I think in some areas they did well, and I would like to borrow that kind of concept. But in other areas, I disagree with the direction they set. So, I mean, that's that's kind of an interesting thing to talk about. What separates Neverwinter 2 from Neverwinter 1 in your mind? Uh, well, to me, Neverwinter 2 really came down to it was more about the adventure that was crafted for you to control a party through. Mm -hmm. Because the two expansions towards the end were very much like Baldur's Gate in that it was a party-driven experience at its core. Yeah, and, and to me, Neverwinter Nights was always about the D&D &D core experience. Like, when you go to play D&D &D with, your, with your group, you play with your character. You don't have your sheet and five others. Because if everybody showed up with, like, five companions and their main character, they would spend the entire time just talking about what their companions were doing. I really want that story to be about the player and player char. Uh, we have a question from the audience. What am I playing? I am playing Shadows of Undrantide, one of the official campaign expansions for Neverwinter Nights. And, and I'm getting hit by traps like nonstop here. Yeah, Phil. But I don't care. You know why? Phil has made I some have resistance. Phil has made some bad life choices, but uh, resistance wasn't a bad one. Speaking of bad life choices. Phil, how did you end up at Beamdog? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> Give us the hyper-abbreviated version. Uh, I was working uh, in Grand Prairie with Hermitworks, which is another game company. Which and, was uh, Cameron Topher's previous... Which was Cameron Topher's previous venture, and uh, that shut down. And then Cam was like, listen, I can't do anything with you. Get the hell out of my house. So I drove to Edmonton, and I started here. And Phil started with us as a producer. He was uh, responsible for putting games into the Beamdog store and making stuff work. And uh, I think I got 400 games up, and then we took them all down because <laughs> we decided to just do BG. Well, we found that other people's games just weren't selling on, on our platform that because people came to our platform to get our awesome stuff. If Do you guys want to try out Sea of Thieves is the question. I've been Thieves? seeing a bit yeah. of the streaming stuff about that. It sounds kind of cool. I would like to try it out, yes. Yes, it looks neat. And I would like to, I would like to find Phil's ship, and I would like to sink his ship, and then I would like to sail repeatedly around the hole in the ocean where his ship lays on the bottom, and I would figure out ways to taunt his bodies that lay on the bottom of the ocean, because that is, that is how I feel about Phil right now, because of his sinking of my battleships. So I'm gonna get like four <laughs> ships, and I'm gonna label them one, three, four, and five, and just let them cruise around, and then Trent can chase down number two forever. Yeah. Uh, here's a question to me. Um, have I considered a backup career as a professional wrestler? 
if game development doesn't pan out? Um, no, no. Um, if it doesn't pan out, you've been at this for I've, I've been long doing, enough to claim uh, that it panned out. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm kind of committed to the game dev thing. The, uh, the professional wrestler thing, I'm old and creaky now. I would break in half if somebody did anything bad to me. It's, it's kind of like that whole idea of, of, I do Muay Thai for fun. The idea of everybody always asks me is like, oh, have you gotten a ring and actually fought somebody? I'm like, Christ, no. They're going to send somebody my size in against me. <laughs> and that person's going to want to hit me in the head. And I make my living with my head. And I'm fond of my head. So the idea of some big galoot like myself punching me in the head is right out. Not allowable. So the answer is no, not until they eliminate weight classifications. Um, and I'm allowed to fight really small guys who are, who are in some way crippled. <laughs> so I never want to engage in a fair fight. Uh, so Ever. jumping back to uh, the topic of Neverwinter 2. Um, Neverwinter 2, one of the major features it had over Neverwinter 1 was it had height map terrain. Yes. So the difference between Neverwinter 1 and 2 with height map terrain is with Neverwinter 1, all the terrain was built out of specific tiles. So it was all flat. That is true, but I actually built a prototype of Neverwinter before Ooh. we moved to the tile-based system, which was height field based. So and height we fields. actually made the determination that height field did not allow the end users to create the areas that we felt they would want to, that we felt it was too limited in what it could do. Specifically, interiors and castle environments and, and building towns, and we just felt it was too limiting. And, and at the time, I think that was true, given the polygon counts and, and given kind of all the criteria around that. I mean, height field works brilliant for outdoor terrain. It really does, because everything is kind of like that. But you get into caverns, you get into buildings, it's just not quite the same. So uh, for those who aren't aware, height map uh, stuff means that you've got a flat plane and then you can selectively raise or lower uh, points on it, yeah. which ma makes this smooth, sort of more natural-ish looking terrain. But it's also a lot harder to build stuff with height map if you're not a level designer, basically. If this isn't something that you do day in, day out, it can actually be overwhelming. Um, I, I mean, uh, the first game I worked on, well, sorry, set, the first commercially shipping game that I worked on as a professional game developer was uh, Shattered Steel, and it had height field terrain, and it was real-time deformable, and we knew the ins and outs of what it could do, and we, we rejected it as but an it, option. I mean, from the perspective of somebody who buys this game, goes into the toolkit, in Neverwinter 1, that person can quickly snap together a dungeon and a town and play it right away. And in Neverwinter 2, you can find yourself uh, getting bogged down with like adjusting height maps and fine-tuning stuff instead of actually focusing on getting the thing done. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, if I could press a button and say, make awesome outdoor area, but don't, and it just does make, a looking, make an awesome looking outdoor area, and then I can just twiddle it. That would be cool to me. That would you, be something you I would. You heard here first, folks. Trent is adding procedural generation <laughs> of forests to Neverwinter. Uh, no, I am not. I said it would be cool if. Um, do we ever play modules with custom content? Yep. I mean, on the stream or personally or well, both is yes because yep. we've uh, done people's custom modules in the past. Yep. We're going to be doing more persistent world uh, visits on these streams in the future. And as more enhanced edition features and modules come online, we're going to be checking out a bunch of those on the stream. Yeah, so if you are running a persistent world and you want to be featured in the stream, get in touch with us. Yeah, reach out. I'm more than happy to come take a tour of your server. We'll, we'll get Phil to, to jump on your server. He'll run around. He'll probably die a lot because he does that. I can't focus on more than one thing at a time. True. Uh, here's a question. What class, build, and alignment are you playing in Shadows and why? So I, uh, hold on. You're I'm a barbarian, a are you not? No, I'm a fighter. You're a fighter? Yeah. You're a pretty meat and potatoes fighter? I'm a high, or sorry, half elf neutral good fighter. That's not a meat and potatoes fighter. And I have more constitutions than God. You have 21 constitution. That's right. 20 strength. A bit of a bonus. At least you did something right. The reason I'm playing a half elf fighter is because uh, Andrew, one of the QA people here, prepared this save for me ahead of time uh, so that I would have something to play on the stream. Uh, and the reason that he chose fighter is probably because it's very easy to play a fighter and I get very distracted while streaming. So 
a class that allows me to click and not care for a few seconds while I chat about things is probably good for me. Yeah, spellcaster inattention is death. You'll so. notice I don't pause very often on the stream. <laughs> yeah. Well, we figure nobody wants to watch Phil sitting there paused in the game. It's true. Uh, any classic settings or modules you'd love to play in Neverwinter Nights? Spelljammer. <laughs> it's always it's always going to be Spelljammer and Dark Sun. Dark Sun. And Dark Sun. Dark Sun. And uh, um, for me, uh, classic modules, G1, 2, and 3. Yeah. Old Greyhawk. Greyhawk uh, is um, uh, White Plume Mountain. Black Razor. Did anyone ever do a... I think someone did. Someone did a module of Expedition to the Barrier Peaks for Neverwinter. Yeah, that's the one with the blasters and stuff? Yeah. With Dude, the and in stuff. my world... In my fantasy, there is no room for muskets, shotguns, and blasters. That's why you hate Spelljammer. That's I why I hate it. Spelljammer. All right. All right. Uh, here's a question. Speaking of height, is there going to be a possibility where one can actually go under a bridge mm. instead of port through, porting through it? Um, so the way it's set up is Neverwinter and Knights is actually 2.5D, as we call it. It's The walk mesh is projected top down, so it's actually impossible to walk under an area as it currently is. Uh, going forward, I don't see us changing the existing content. And if we were to do that in new content, it would basically mean a completely new pathfinding system, which we did some experimentation with. And uh, I don't think we're going to be able to progress with that. So I would probably say not likely. Uh, do you guys have access to older D&D games like Ravenloft, Stone Prophet, or the Dark Sun games? Define access. I mean, <laughs> have we played I can, them? I can can go we, play them today. Can we go download them and poke them? I, I totally played Dark Sun. Uh, what was the Ravager? What was it called? I think so. It was like it was a little bit like BG in that it was like a top down thing. All I got to was turn based. Half giants. Oh, half moles, giants are uh, awesome. Wait, were they? Are they called? Yeah, they're moles. Moles are dwar yeah, half dwarves. dwarves, and they're they're sterile. So tiny, hey, tiny. Interesting. T shirt first. All right, all right. Dennis R420. You get a t shirt. Patow. All right. So, sorry, back to your story. In interesting lore story. Well, interesting to me. So, malls. Malls are half dwarves, right? Correct. The Forgotten Realms has half elves, halflings, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Halflings. But they do <laughs> not have half dwarves. And the reason for that is Wizards of the Coast specifically decided, you know what? Malls are going to be a specific feature of Dark Sun. We want to leave that flavor in that setting and not just have all settings have the same sort of races and flavor. Or maybe they just felt that half dwarf wasn't that different from dwarf, because dwarf and human, I mean, it's not that different. Pretty close. It's but like... the interesting thing, though, is when we were working on Siege of Dragon Spear. Okay. So, Daros Dragon Spear, originally in the lore, was a half dwarf. But then after that point was when Wizards of the Coast decided, no, we want to split that out. So when we were building Seed of Dragon Spear, they said, well, actually, could you massage the lore a little bit? We're going to retcon it so that he was actually just a very tall dwarf. And uh, we'll leave it at that instead of saying that he was a half dwarf. So half dwarf, tall dwarf. Not seeing a whole lot of really caring here. They cared enough to make a distinction. That's, uh, that's the will we get story. some new weapon, idle, and combat animations? You shouldn't be holding a flaming greatsword like that. Have you ever held a flaming greatsword? Phil's, Phil's pretty comfortable with flames. Like, Ultimately, he, he doesn't really care much. Is your name Barak Dondarian? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> He's, he, he was getting a little messed up towards the end there, dude. It's only so many times you can come back from the dead. Every time, a little less. A little less, a little diminished. But um, I think animations are one of those things that could stand a little leaven. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think well, if, if we have higher uh, fidelity creature models, you'll notice the animation is lacking, I think. I think it's one of the things, one of those things that we're going to address yeah. along the way. Um, did we ever play Dark Sun, Shattered Lands, or sequel, Wake of the Ravager? Totally. I loved, I had like, my main character was like a half giant. I was like, he is going to mess people up. Look at the strength. He is awesome. You should know that I value strength above all. What I really appreciated about uh, Dark Sun is that the player races were really out there, like Thrykeens and stuff like that. What other RPG system as a base race has, you know, giant mantises? I don't know. What I loved about Dark Sun was just the fact that the world was such a horrible, harsh place. It's like, yeah, there's these massive cities. Oh, and they're ruled by basically evil demigods. 
So the world's a pretty horrible place with a lot of horrible things going on. I like to see Dark Sun as D and D if it took place on the Klingon homeworld, <laughs> where they had killed and eaten their gods long ago. You and your Star Trek references. Right. I have hey, to kill so you. Oh, so uh, because we had some audio issues, oh, yeah. Phil. Um, we're going to give away a bonus T-shirt. Bonus T-shirt. For the audio mistake, which is not the word that is on the screen in front of me. <laughs> we are giving it away to Jukataja. 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 There you go. Patao. All right. So just, just briefly here. Is this not the temple in Neverwinter, the city from the first campaign? But it doesn't have all the dead things on the ground in the original campaign. This is classic asset reuse. Um, maybe. Somebody took that room and was like, with a few adjustments. This this again, again, temple. you're saying that like it's a bad thing. Um, question. Are there any plans to create new single player expansion content? Yes. Yes, there, is, there are plans. Turning plans to reality is our business, and business is good. Um, like we've got that. another thing that says, rapidly rap, rap, rap. Start to wrap it up, boys. Is this the part where we do our freestyle beam dog rap? All no, right. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, it's not, no. no. <laughs> All right. Don't, well, don't make me stab you, Phil. Okay. Shall we uh, let these people go yeah. back and enjoy their lives and we can stop talking so, about Neverwinter? Again, thanks for watching us. Uh, Neverwinter Head Start. You can buy Neverwinter Nights on Beamdog and get into the Head Start program. You can wishlist it on Steam. Yeah, you can wishlist it on Steam. If you buy it on Beamdog and you're playing on it now, you can still get a Steam key from us. That's right. When we go live on Steam, you can request a key from support and we will hook you up. And because we are insane and have put the tablet versions on sale, which we do about once a year, you should probably tell everyone that you know that they should go and buy the tablet versions of Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 2, Icewind Dale, Planescape Torment. You know Because they are awesome. On the bus that you see every morning and there's kind of an awkward thing going on between you, he needs to know about this sale. You should totally tell yeah. him. Dude, you need Baldur's Gate in your life. It would make you better. All right, so grab uh, the Enhanced Editions, available on Beamdog, Steam, wherever fine games are sold. And uh, one final thing, we have some job listings here at Beamdog. If you know how to program things or if you feel that you would be an asset to us, we invite you to apply. Uh, if you go to beamdog.com slash jobs, we got a ton of positions available right now. We are staffing up pretty hardcore. We are, we are staffing up. Yeah. And if you read the job descriptions, you may learn secrets. Secret. Secrets. Secrets. S plans within plans within plans, my friends. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, folks. And uh, we will see you next Friday. I really hope.